All right, well, welcome everyone to another one of these lessons. So today we are going to be looking at SQL. Now, I'm specifically going to be showing you examples with MySQL. However, what you learn now applies to basically any uh, database language that uses SQL as its sort of like heart. So for example, there's MySQL that is made by uh, well, I think MySQL is now owned by Oracle, but before it was, I don't think those are the ones that started it. It was purchased by them. Um, let me see who started it. Uh, history by a Swedish company, MySQL AB. So then it was bought out by, by, SQL, by Oracle. Oracle is a really, really large corporation. Oracle has their own SQL language called just uh, uh, PL SQL. And that one is essentially the same thing as this, like very, very close. Like we're talking about the differences between like C and C++ close. Like there's a sometimes a little bit of de differences in syntax. Like I have a list somewhere. You can Google it online. Some very specific things like joins might be different. And then the programming side is a little bit different too. But at the heart, it's the same concepts. Uh, similarly, there are other, other ones there's the Win the Microsoft SQL server. That's also very, very close. They all use the same concept of databases and query languages and going back to what is known as domain calculus, tuple calculus, and uh, relational algebra. That's what this is all based off of. It's very mathematical. There are variations of this that are the like NoSQL databases that are going to still have the same query language but with some flexibility at the cost of speed so things like uh, pl sql or sorry not pl sql sorry my post postgres sql um, will vary a little bit and we have an example of that database set up if you can play with it if you want someday but really they all have the same heart of the thing like you're gonna have a select query the insert statements might vary by some you know double quotes instead of single quotes, that kind of thing, but they all the same thing, okay? Again, it's it's as close as I would say something like C versus C++ when you're just using it at the basic level, it's the same thing, like you get your for loop, you got your arrays, you got, um, you know, like if statement is the same, but there might be some tiny little differences, like for example, you know, with, in C++, the way strings work versus C or like, I'm trying to think of any of something that would be peculiarly different. Maybe like void pointers, you know, something very picky like that that you're not going to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so the reason being that P the original PL SQL with Oracle that was I think from the 70s, they 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 sell that for a lot of money. And so I think that what the MySQL people did is they they basically created a free version of that that didn't violate copyrights, but it was free, um, and it was very close, so the developers could could basically switch over. And they became very, very popular to the point that Oracle felt threatened by them and they just bought them out. And they, you know, they didn't want to just shut them down because they would seem as evil. So they still left what's known as a community edition, which is still free. But uh, basically they went out and said, well, the community edition is like the the the, the gateway drug. You, you try it out. But when you start, when your company grows and you really need support, then you gotta pay money, and so that's kind of the business side of MySQL. But it's still very, very popular, and there's variations of it that are still open source fully. Like there's MariaDB and things like that. Again, everything using around the SQL language. Okay, so the first thing that I want to show you with with the uh, with SQL, if you've never ever experienced SQL, is kind of like the basic idea of how you store data. And for that, actually, I think we're better off using it, the tablet so that I can draw you some examples of that. So I think most of you have taken data structures at this point. Um, and if not, then you probably know the, the concept of time and space, right? So on one end, you want to make things fast. On the other end, you want to make things take the least amount of space possible. What are some extremes? Things like compression. Compression really, really shortens the amount of space you need. 
at the cost of a lot of time to be able to use the data because you have to de just de decrypt it first and then um, and then actually be able to use it. On the other end, you have something like a direct access table, which is like a hash table, but but there's there's never any collisions because you have every possible hash as a spot. You know, you could store something like a kilobyte of data and it takes a terabyte of space to be able to store it with a direct access table because of how big it is. And so that's the other end. You have super, super fast access time and insert time and any anything dealing with the data, but you have just an insane amount of space that you need to be able to use it. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and switch to the iPad. There we go. So the idea when people came up with the database was to try to come up with a good middle ground, but that favored access time. Uh, because we had insane amounts of data We're talking like imagine a bank storing all of the clients bank data and they're all storing it uh, in, in, the, in the database essentially and you want to be able to when, when a person goes to the bank and they go to the to the uh, to, to the ATM and they want to they want to get some money from their account there's a couple of different things that have to have to happen right so you have the person oh, it's not, There we go. Okay. So you have the person, you know, they, they come to the ATM. And so they, they push buttons in the ATM and they insert their credit card. And so you have the credit card number. And so that credit card number needs to communicate to some central computer, some server somewhere, and basically feed that number in. And in that computer, there is a list of information, right? So we got all of the information of all of the accounts in the back. And so it has to search in that list and identify this account. So it finds it here. And from there, it needs to, you know, basically return to the user, you know, what, what, what different uh, sub accounts that I have, like a credit card versus a debit card and whatnot. And then also return maybe like its balance, right? So it says that he has $100 there. And then now, this person has to go in and say, well, I want $20 out of that. And so he has to send a request over here. Again, it has to refine it again, because it can't just save it, because there could be a billion different other people using it at the same time. Well, not a billion, but, you know, like 100 other people in the entire country. And then request that, and then reduce the transaction amount. The, you know, send, send, reduce $120 uh, for, for, from their balance, and then save that have no risk of like connection issues where like, suppose that he's sending the request to lower the account by $20 and then, you know, when it gets here and then it gets reduced, there's a hiccup and before it updates the table that his account went down to 80, before sending back the 20, there's like some power outage or something and now there's money that disappeared or something. We need to have some sort of data integrity. That's another big deal of, of, of databases. And then essentially send back the okay to remove $20 and also to lower the balance of his account and then be good to go. Now this, you know, you, you know, if you think from a data structure perspective, you might be like, well, I could put it on the hash table. Um, I could put it on like a, on, a, on, a, on like a, just a list and sort it and then just do like binary search or I could put it on, the, on like an ABL tree. And uh, a lot of these options are fast, but they can get really tricky when you have massive amounts of data. Not to mention the fact that with something like an ABL tree, which kind of gets you really fast insertions and access and search and queries, it has to be on main memory for it to be efficient. Otherwise, the whole thing kind of dies. And that's one of the big issues with, with these databases. They're so big that you can't practically hold them in memory, especially because of integrity issues. Like you don't even want to hold the entire database in memory because that's how like you lose information if there's a power outage. You're like, Imagine that a hundred people took out money from the ATM and then there's a power outage before you actually save to the hard drive all those transactions. And now people got free money essentially because there's no record of the, of the removal. And so, you know, it, you, you, you have to have, sure you want to use RAM to speed things up, but you also have to have a way of having the data in a hard drive and still make it quickly accessible. 
And as we know, hard drives are slow. So that's another reason for using databases. And so I'm not gonna go too in depth as to how the databases actually store the information, but the most popular ones are what's known as B trees. And B trees are kind of like binary trees and kind of like ABL trees in a way. And what they work is they have, they're trees, but instead of holding one piece of information in the, in the node, so like, you know, think back to ABL trees, they just hold one piece of information, right? Uh, not here. Here they hold indices to more information. So like, let's just say we're holding a bunch of names in this table. This might have the letters, the letters A through like G. This might have from like G again, but like a later part of G, like let's say GA versus GE. Uh, or maybe GB, I guess, technically. Um, and then all the way to like, I don't know, T, and then T to W, and then W to Z or something, okay? So it might have sort of this distribution. And then each of these will point to other little subtrees that have more indices. And so you have a bunch of indices until on the last layer, you actually contain the data, okay? So what's the advantage of doing this? The advantage of doing this is that you can hold all of the pointer stuff in main memory, but then all of the data itself is held on hard drives. And so what you ideally want is the look, and it might be multiple hard drives, by the way. So, because it's such a huge amount of data, you have to, you have to think like big here, like think about Bank of America, for example, and how much data they have on someone in an account, like, and then multiply that times the number of users they have. And so we start thinking about an insane amount of data. We're not even doing like terabytes. We're going far bigger than that. And this is just raw, hardcore, like text. So it's insane amount of data. It's not something that you can just buy a bunch of hard drives and put them together in series or do like a RAID system and then just hold it all in one location. We're talking like massive. And so even this indice system is massive itself. But the idea of all of this is that you are able to essentially locate where the data is stored so then you can pull up that data. And you can have a cache system like another system so that you can allow you know, quick access to the data so if it gets used, you know, if somebody's using an account, they, the next time they do it, you know, they finish the transaction, it's more quickly accessed. You can, there's a lot of uh, like algorithms to how to update these these different indices and how to create them as you insert more data and whatnot. So there's a lot more to this, but you don't need to know it. You'll learn it if you take the bit of his course with, with Tagra at some point, uh, like the actual internals. But really, the, the reason I'm giving you this, this sort of basics is so that you understand the importance of databases in the world. It's, it's insanely big, big to, to, to know that this is like, like the most used data structure and probably Last time I checked, the, in terms of computer science jobs out there, databases is number one in the number of positions. And they're not very highly paid positions. Databases is kind of like on the lower end of the cool factor of computer science. But it's kind of those things that you just always have a job out there for this. And that's because there's just an insane amount of databases out there uh, just waiting to be, you know, <laughs> breached by a hacker or something. That's the other issue that we have all these databases and now we have to take care of them. But anyways, so at this layer, we have the actual data, okay? So that's how things are stored. Uh, now within data, you know, that's, that's the storage side. We still have to talk about the speed up side. So when you're accessing data and you're trying to store data, you know, like, you have to think of a way to organize data. So if you have, for example, list of information you're trying to keep. So let's say that you have a business. So you have an employees table. And by the way, I downloaded a sample database from MySQL that has employees. I haven't looked at it too carefully. So, uh, you know, maybe it'll have something similar to this. Maybe it won't, but you know, I, we're just gonna kind of go with this and then uh, Play with that database as well. So we let's say we have an employees table. Okay, and this employees table is going to contain a bunch of information. In fact, let's not forget about the, the table concept for now. Let's just say, let's just list what information we're trying to store. Okay, so we have a business and we have a bunch of employees and they have roles and we're trying to, or you know, we don't we're not computer scientists, we're just some guy 
or, or woman who, who is just like, uh, you know, is, wants to store data for their employees. So they don't know yet, you know, they have a meeting later today with someone that's gonna help them make the database, but they told them to write down the things that they wanna store in the computer. So what are some of the things, and, and you all can chime in if I forget something, that they, uh, that they would wanna store there. So they probably wanna store the name. And they might wanna store like the first name, and the last thing. Now, this is not something that someone does not see us would probably think they would just be like, yeah, just name, but we know we want to split it. Um, they might also want to store some sort of employee ID. So some sort of number. Okay, a single number that identifies the employee. We may also want to store um, um, how many years they've been with the company. So years with company. We also want to store what they do at the company, so maybe their role, their position. Let's see, what else would be useful to keep up on an employee? Um, we could do something like current tasks. That's a good one, actually. Oh yeah, salary, that's really good too, salary. So you want salary. Tax information, so like social security number, and then uh, Ah, yes. So telephone, maybe address, maybe email address. I think that's pretty big. That, that should be good enough for now. Oops. Maybe like uh, the address itself is probably going to be split into like zip code, city, and street. Right? Street, zip code, yeah. That should be good. I guess maybe one more for uh, street two, because like you know you have like people that live in apartments, they have a second lay a second address that says like apartment number. Although that could go in the same one with the streets is really big. Yeah, we'll just do that. Okay, so yeah, I mean there might be more, but this is pretty good, and I like this because this is very varied kind of information. So let me put to you the the bad way of doing this that people do. So you know. Someone that's not a CS person, they, you know, if, if they just they just hire some guy that kind of knows some computers, they don't, they don't hire like a database person, he's going to come and he's going to be like, okay, you guys all want all this, let me pull up an Excel spreadsheet and just, uh, yeah, we'll just make each, uh, each row, like we'll just make these column names and then basically um, each row will be one employee and we'll just have massive stacks of information. Uh, but then you run into issues with things like this, right, where you want to split them. So I guess you can just make them their own columns, like address zip, address city, address street. And then, um, you know, you just can't do it like that. And it'll work fine if you have 10 employees, if you have 100 employees maybe. But if you have 10,000 employees, that's when... Uh, your spreadsheet is going to start to really slow down whenever you want to update it. And it's also prone to mistakes because, like, let's say somebody forgets to enter something or uh, they don't keep some sort of data integrity for this. Uh, not to mention the fact that it's just a spreadsheet, which that makes it kind of iffy if you want to automate anything. Uh, so it's not ideal and it's not going to be fast, especially when you scale. When you scale to, like, a million employees, this is not the way to go. Spreadsheets, I think, are limited to something like I, I used to know the number just because it was one of those things you just preach in class, but um, it's not that big actually. Max number of rows in Excel. 1,048,576. And then how many columns? 16,384 columns. So you can have, in a spreadsheet, you can have 1 million by basically 16K. Not bad, we don't have 16K row, uh, columns, but it's very possible for a company to have more than 1 million employees. Not to mention the fact that, how big is that file gonna be? Because um, it's gonna be... That's just because Microsoft is ghetto, man. I don't think that matters. 
But no, I know what you mean. Hey, but hey, that's a solution. You need, you need, you have two million employees. Just make two sheets, <laughs> sheet one and sheet two. But um, yeah. So the problem is going to be speed when you're trying to find information from here. Because like, suppose that I ask you, hey, you know, like I need to see who, like, how much our employees are getting paid. So can you like give me a list of all of the salaries from lowest to highest sorted? And so now you're going to have to basically pull out all the salaries, run your bubble sort or quick sort, uh, and then sort all the information out and then print it out. And that's going to take time too. You know, anytime and somebody asks you something really complicated, like, you know, let's, uh, let's generate salaries by zip code. Like, I want to see what, like, like, like if like all the rich people in the company live somewhere, you know, because we're doing some analytics on this. And so, Maybe the government is asking for this stuff too. And so like, you have to generate that. And so how do you do that? Well, you have to like write some Python script or some program to do that. And it's not gonna be fast either. And so SQL not only allows you to store information quickly, but it allows you to do those kind of, to answer those kind of questions, uh, which is very powerful when you're doing like data analytics, but in general, when you're just trying to learn more about your data and have it access quickly, okay? so. There are many different ways to sort of create this into tables. Uh, I'm just gonna, like they're called normalizations, I believe, like normal forms. There's back nap normal form, third normal form, first normal form. Uh, but the idea is that you want to split the information into more than one table. And then you wanna have one of the columns be unique. Or if you can't do that, then you wanna make a combination of of, uh, of multiple columns to be sort of a unique thing. So for example, in this case, it's pretty easy. We, we can, the employee ID or the social security are gonna be things that are very unique. Uh, I wouldn't say the telephone is unique because you might have like a husband and a wife that are working together and they might have the same house phone number listed or like a, like a kid and their parent, um, like a multi-generational thing, I guess they're working in the same company. But uh, you definitely don't wanna have things like salary being unique because Two people could run the same thing. But let's say that you didn't have employee ID or social security number. You could still generate sort of unique things by mixing multiple columns, like maybe first, last name, and then maybe uh, email, ad email address. Actually, that's, uh, that's cheating because that was pretty unique. But actually, no. So telephone. So telephone is not unique, right? But if we mix it with the names, that would be very, very rare to have someone that has the first, the same first and last name and the same telephone number. Um, I guess if you're, you know, like my dad has the same name as me, at least the same first and last name. So if we were working for the same company, that would be an issue, I suppose. Yeah, but most cases it wouldn't be, okay? And so um, let's actually split this into a way that it would be stored in the database. So what you would do is you take all of these columns. So I'm just gonna do some copy pasting and moving around because I don't have to rewrite this all the time. And we're gonna start by taking, we're gonna make, we, we're gonna make a bunch of tables and we're gonna name them uh, accordingly. So for example, let's just have a personnel table, okay? So personnel, I think it's like spelled like that. And the unique identifier for that is going to be employee ID. And then let's just have in there the first and last name. Hold on. Remember how to fix this. There we go. Nope. There we go. Okay. So let's take employee. Let's take first and last name. And I think that's that's as much as we would like to put there. Okay. Now let's make another table and we're gonna call it contact information. I'm having issues with the tablet. I remember this was a thing and there was a way to fix this, but it might just be the, the tip. Let me try to take the tip off a moment. Okay, seems to be okay now. So we're going to put contact information. Well, I just, we'll just call it contact, actually. Yeah. 
It died off again. Huh, it's out of power, that's it. It's out of battery, okay. So, um, let me just let it charge for a little bit. If it, if it just keeps dying, we'll just type these out, okay? Um, so let's just do uh, contact. And then for contact, we still need to have some sort of common thing. We're gonna call that the primary key. And that's gonna be the employee ID, but now we're gonna put in here maybe a telephone number, and then all the, 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 the address stuff, which is gonna be three different things. So, let's also put the email address in here. And so, again, this thing is going to be essentially, well, here, let's just, it'll be faster, just copy paste. We'll just do the zip, the city, and the street address, which we'll just call street. Okay, I gotta do this faster before this thing dies. And then um, next, let's talk about uh, maybe like a pay, a pay stuff, pay slip, something. We'll just call it pay table. That's gonna be like the finance stuff. So again, we wanna have something that can link to a specific employee, which we're gonna use the employee ID. And then in there, we're gonna put the salary. We're gonna put their social security number. And then that's, I would say that's it. And then finally, we're gonna make another one, which is gonna be called like the position table. Well, we might call it like employee position. And then we're gonna put the remainder of the stuff, but we're also gonna go ahead and put employee. Okay, like that, I'll leave it charging. So the idea of doing all of this is that now we have split what is essentially one massive table into smaller, leaner tables that are gonna be, you know, yes, there's gonna be some repeated data because we're gonna have employee ID multiple times. We could even add in a, like, so, like if we really want it on the pay table, we could put in their last name or we could put on their, on, or, or like the email address, we could put on their, uh, you know, uh, the pay table as well or in employee position or something but the idea is that by making the table smaller we're able to process them better and faster okay now if we wanted to go with the extreme way to make things super lean and efficient we would make all of these tables be two columns one of them being the employee id and then the other one being basically one of each of these, so like employee and first name, employee and last name, employee and year, employee and role, employer and task, employer salary, employee and social security number, and so on. So we would have like a lot of tables, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 tables we would have. I believe that one is called third normal form, if you do it that way, three and a half. No, that's not three and a half. I think this is the way we did it now is three and a half. Um, maybe, maybe that might be first normal form, one and a half. Uh, maybe it's been a while, but I'll I'll send you guys some geeks for geeks links on, on like the official names of this stuff. But anyways, now that we have the data like this. It's a lot better to access, and this and this process of like taking data and splitting it into tables is not trivial. This is trivial, but not for real cases, because you have hundreds of columns that you're trying to work with. Uh, it, it, it takes years for a proper company to develop a good database, okay? So again, this, this is much bigger, uh, I, but yeah, so, okay. So now let's talk about the query language. And the relation of algebra, again, gets pretty hardcore. I'm not gonna go that in depth. I'm just gonna go into the query language stuff, but everything that I'm doing has a mathematical basis. Like it was created so it's mathematically sound because that's what makes it fast, okay? You're basically just doing math when you're doing this, like relational algebra. I'll write that down in case you wanna Google it later. But like I said, if you're gonna take the database class at some, at some point, you'll learn that. That class is disguised as partially a math class. So 
the first month you're just doing math. Um, but yeah, so for example, let's say that we want to just get all of the information in the personnel table, okay? The way that the query language works is as follows. This is the most basic sense of that is like this. We have what's known as a select statement. So we write the word select, and for now, we're just gonna leave an asterisk here, which means all, so that stands for all. And then you write from, and then the from is what, where you wanna get the data from, what table. So in this case, we're gonna get it from the personnel table. From personnel, and then, just like C++, you have to put a semicolon at the end of a command. So SQL is white space insensitive, like C++, where it doesn't matter if you if you uh, if you put 10,000 spaces here, like there, or you put this in its own line, doesn't matter. You know, you could move this down here, you could tab it, you could do whatever you want with it. Uh, it doesn't care because it uses the uh, the semicolon as the signal to end that specific command just like c plus plus okay so that could be the end of a query but you could also have another section to it in fact you could have a lot more other sections but the most popular one being the where clause the where clause is 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 there to allow you to limit what kind of information you want so for example if we just go ahead and do a query with the, what we have now without the where clause what we're going to essentially get is a table. So whenever you do a query, you get a table back, always. Your table might be a single item, but it's technically a single item table. So in this case, we're gonna get back a table that is gonna contain all of the information from the personnel table, which is going to be the employee ID, um, the first name, and then the last name, which I'm just abbreviating for now, okay? And so it's going to contain a bunch of rows, and these rows will match what is in the personnel table. So, you know, let's just say that we're like the, the team, right? So this might be like, like Spencer. So Spencer's number might be like that, and then his first name, you know, Spencer, and then uh, his last name, okay? I don't know if I swear your last name right, but I think that's right. Uh, so that is what you would get back. However, suppose that you only wanted to get back a specific row. For example, let's say you're looking for a specific employee. So you're looking for employee whose code ends in S or whose code is S11, the employee ID. So you're looking for, for this. That's where your where clause comes in useful. So your where clause allows you to limit the amount of information you get from the query. So for example, you could say something like where, and you gotta match some names. So let's just say the name is ID. And by the way, it's also uppercase and lowercase insensitive. So it doesn't care uh, when it comes to the, the variable names. So this is different than C++, I suppose. You can make it uppercase and lowercase. And it's like, it's good, it's all good. Uh, it doesn't care about that either. It does care when you're actually trying to match things. Like if you're matching strings and you put quotes, then yes, that matters. Like you want to care, I think, in those cases. Uh, but let's say you wanted just to say that this is equal to S11, okay? I guess that's a string technically, so let's put it in quotes. In this case, and then of course don't forget your semicolon, I can put it there actually, it doesn't care because remember it's a white space insensitive, so all that space is going to be ignored. So now, rather than getting all of the employees, I'm only going to get the rows where the actual employee ID matches what I ask, which in this case is only going to be Spencer. So I would get a table with a single row and three columns back. Okay, suppose that I only wanted to get the first name and not the entire column, like the three columns. Well, I can change this here. This means everything from the table, all columns. But I can get rid of this, let's just leave it over here, and I can instead list the column names there that I want back. So let's say I just want first name. That's the CGC, the column names FN. If I change my query to this, so it's no longer all. Now this would only return a table with a single column, which would be, which would look like this. And 
then let's just get rid of that, get rid of that, and that, and this will be back. And because I'm only requesting the Spencer one, then I'm literally gonna get a table with a single entry on it. It's a one cell table, essentially, a one by one. But it's still technically a table, which is important when you're doing some of the weird fancy things, you gotta understand that it's still just, like what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna connect SQL uh, through your website or through whatever you're working on. And when you're using the library, you're gonna request it and it's still gonna be an array. So you're gonna to have to look at array spot zero to to get that item back, even if it's a single value. So like, you know, you if if it, if it returns an array called array, you're gonna to have to do this basically um, to be able to get that. Otherwise, it'll tell you that it's it's a list, it's not an actual value. So it can be annoying sometimes. But okay, but that's because you could have gotten more than one response back if if uh, let, let let's just say an example where you where you uh, would get some more than one item back let's just say that instead of looking for employee ID you were looking for first name where first name is equal to uh, Spencer okay and instead of getting first name let's say that you're getting because I would make I mean, you just get Spencer back let's just say that you're looking for last names okay so let's say that we did that well, let's just say that uh, Spencer had, you know, or let, let, not, not Spencer, but let's just say that we had another person working whose first name was also Spencer. So let's just say we had like another Spencer whose name was Gucci, <laughs> okay? And his, he has a different employee ID. But the point is that when we do this query, we're actually gonna get back a table with two items. One of them is gonna be Lucci and the other one is gonna be Gucci like that so here's a case where we get a column we get a table with two rows single column okay so that's really the heart of query languages like the select statement everything else I mean there's table creation table insertion and table deletion of information value insertions but but the heart of everything is going to be based on this query thing and there are things like nested queries so think of that like recursion in a way not really but kind of um, there's join statements. There's going to be a lot, a lot of other things, but this is the heart of it. And you're not going to go really in depth with like faculty mentor stuff. You don't need that much of SQL for that. Okay. But now we're done with with uh, with the tablet. Let's actually use a database. Okay. So let's switch over. Go ahead. Yeah. So if you, let's say that we, we have the same query, but instead of first name putting Spencer, let's say that we make a typo and we say Spence, like without the E or something. That would return an empty table, like you said. So yes, you would literally get back, in this case, you'd get back a table with just one column uh, with, with no rows, basically, with no rows. Alternatively, if you requested select all from this and then still had the typo, you would get a table with three columns, but no rows. It will not warn you. So you got to check the length of the, of, the, of the array when you make a query to make sure that it's not zero. Otherwise, you might crash. Like you might be accessing out of bounds or something. Uh, so like you want to do like Python, you use length or whatever you do in PHP or, or whatnot. But yes, you will get back an empty query. Now, if you make a bad query, so let, let's say you make a typo on the table name. So if you make a typo on the table name, so you say like personnel instead of personnel, in that case, then you're gonna get an error. So you're gonna get an exception. And then your program will die unless you, you are doing exception handling. So that's another problem. Uh, but there's, the, you know, it's just a try catch block. I don't, I don't remember what the PHP equivalent of the try catch block is, but there is a way to catch the exception so the program doesn't terminate. Um, I have some sample code I was playing with around for that. But yeah, so those are the two scenarios where you ask for information that's not there, where it's just an empty table back, or where it's actually just like an error that you get because the table doesn't exist, or the column doesn't exist, or the query is just wrong. Like, there's a syntax error. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
You know, the bee trees work in mysterious ways. I don't think that it would keep on the bee tree. Like, I don't think it would actually keep, like, each of these squares on the final layer would be an actual entry of a table. It might be different than that. Like, that's like dark magic going on at that point. It might do things, yeah. There's also ISAM stuff, ISAM and B-Trees. There's the other method is ISAM, which I didn't even mention. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I think that internally, um, when you split your tables correctly, it makes whatever search internal system is set up work more efficiently. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it's a little bit like, like, like process J, right? Like you, you code things for process J, but internally it's just regular code. It's just Java code, right? So, so yeah, no, it's the truth. Like, Process J is very cool and all, but at the, be, behind the scenes is Java code. So here is the same thing. You have this beautiful language called relational algebra, top of calculus, that's beautiful, but I'm pretty sure behind the scene is just a bunch of C code. And so that C code might be using, and that's using the B trees. And I don't know how it's using it, but there's some weird connection going on there. So like I said, I don't know, that's, that's some magic happening there. You just have to kind of, follow what they tell you in terms of splitting your tables correctly so the magic works good otherwise the magic doesn't work that's that's the best way that i can explain it uh but yeah yeah even talk ta even talk about in that class gets to the point where he's like yeah just just accept that this is magic so yeah but no no if you guys google b trees you can really go in depth to this i mean ed jorgensen's master uh not master phd uh, dissertation that he did for his PhD was just on B trees, and it wasn't just B trees. Actually, it was on parallelizing B trees because one of the things that you want to speed up with queries is when you have multiple computers that are trying to access the same database, and so they might be accessing the same leaves of the B tree. So his dissertation was, I think, three algorithms that did different approaches to 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 doing that, like. What can happen is this, like you have one computer, I don't want to go too sidetracked, but it's actually really cool stuff. But like, let's say you have a computer that is accessing this block right here, okay? And then let's say you have another computer um, that is accessing this block, you know, and it goes down down here, okay? Like two ATMs, that's okay. You can update them at the same time, no problem. The problem is that let's say that one is accessing here. It is possible that this creates a new block here, which then updates this layer, which then might update this index. That can break other accesses that are working at the same time. Uh, and of course, if you have two access in here, then things get worse. So there is race condition. There's all the concurrency problems that you will learn in 370 if you, if you haven't taken that yet. So uh, he, he, he basically worked on some algorithms to, uh, to alleviate that issue. Um, and that was just his PhD dissertation, so that was like a lot of work. Just just for that little tiny piece of B trees, which is the heart of a database. So this stuff gets hardcore. By all means, I am not an expert on it. I'm an expert. I, I mean, yeah, I know I know SQL, but I am not an expert in uh, in the behind the scenes of SQL, the back end. So hopefully that that explains or avoids your question the best way possible. Okay. So are there other questions before I move on to like actual SQL? I look up here because that's where I have the camera, but that's what we look in there. Okay. Um, all right. So how to install SQL if you want to play around? 
uh, sudo apt get install mysql dash server, something like that. I have it installed, but I, I guess MariaDB works too, but um, I would use mysql server like this or community edition. Just go to mysql.com community edition and download that. You can also download Workbench, which is a sort of like an IDE for SQL that is kind of connected to the database. It's very cool. Uh, I used it for a long time. I, I still have it installed in a different VM, but uh, that's mostly if you want to just play around and like learn SQL. You wouldn't use that if you're actually developing, uh, unless you have some fancy queries you want to test ahead of time. Uh, once you have it installed, you might need to manually launch the server with this. You, you can check the status by saying service MySQL status, and if it's not running, then start it like this. If it doesn't start by default, and then you just log in by typing MySQL. Okay? If you want to load a database, like if you're playing around and you want to load the same database that I'm working with later, I'll make it. I'll, I'll show you the link. You just basically do what I did here. My employees Linux redirection employee SQL. Employee SQL is basically the insert statement to create the database. Uh, that actually would be very cool. We should look at that because that's going to have lots of examples of insertions and table creation. But before we do that, I think we just want to access data. Let's worry about creating data later. Okay? So I opened the database. And so um, again, I'm recording this so that if you want to refer back to like commands, you know, because I am going to go through a couple of commands quickly. The first one is that. Within a database, or sorry, within SQL, you can have multiple databases. So for example, an employee database, but you might also have like some internal database that is only for like supervisors. Uh, you might have financial database, which is only for like, like ATMs to deal with. You don't want like a, like, a, like a random employee, you know, snooping around user accounts where they shouldn't. So there's a lot of different databases and you can allow uh, privileges of either accessing a database or accessing and modifying a database, uh, or, or just accessing and creating parts of a database. So for example, you might allow somebody to insert entries to a table, but you might not allow them to modify the tables themselves or to create new tables. That's for security reasons and also for avoiding bad things from happening. Uh, there is a joke on the internet called Bobby Tables. Uh, have you got, any of you heard of Bobby Tables? Google it. Bobby tables, meme, meme, little Bobby tables. Where's the actual picture? Here we go. So let me. Uh, let's give here the tragedy of Bobby tables. So this is the story. So. Hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something in a way? Well, did he break something? Well, in a way. Did you really name your son Robert Drop Table Students? Oh yes, Little Bobby Tables we call him. Well, we lost this year's students records. I hope you're happy. Well, and I hope you learn to sanitize your database inputs. So this is what is known as SQL injection, which is what you want to protect when you're working with a database, right? So when you're working with a database, you typically will insert, you know, into that query that I've made, you may want to insert things into the, the work clause where things match, right? So you might parse some string there, but if you're not careful, as you're generating that SQL statement, you're generating a command that's about to get executed. People can, can, can do fancy things like actually insert rogue SQL commands into your, into your, your naive, um, like SQL command that you're making to just request data and then end up doing things that you didn't want to, such as creating tables or worse in this case, deleting tables. So obviously this could have been stopped if, uh, well, that's if it happened. This could have been stopped if, uh, if the school did not allow the user that is requesting data to essentially have privilege to delete data, just to insert. And that would have stopped this issue. The other thing is, when you're, you're sanitizing input means that you want to make sure that there's no weird uh, input on the name of the student, such as actually having commands. So things like a semicolon or parentheses, you know, that's, that was not a sanitizing input. We'll talk about that more later as we learn more commands, but just something cool. So, um, okay, going back to actual stuff. 
So there's multiple databases. So if you want to see what databases you have access to, so you're only going to see the ones that you can actually see, you go and see, uh, click show databases. So like, for example, if there is a database that you don't have access to, you wouldn't even see it listed here. Okay. And that's just, I guess, so that people don't snoop around when they shouldn't, I guess. Uh, Cause you know, if they see a database, even though they can't access it, they might be like, Ooh, what's there? So, uh, here we have this employee database. That's the one that I downloaded. Again, I haven't really seen this, but we are going to explore it right now together. I did see that it has, I did do one query and I see that it had like a lot of results. So I might have to teach you how to use the limit command pretty quickly here. So we're gonna get over, over one by data. But yeah, so show databases allows you to explore all databases. When you decide what database you wanna use, go ahead and type in use database. Uh, actually, we'll use the database name. So use employees. Why is it autocomplete? No, no, no. I don't know. But anyways, you do that. Don't forget the semicolon. By the way, if you do, if you do forget the semicolon, you're gonna get this weird thing. Um, huh? Well, normally you you actually just get. Um, I guess this because it's such a simple command. It auto completed it for me. But um, a lot of the times you just get like an enter, and then you have you. You'll, let's just wait and see when it happens. When you do a select query, you should see it. But anyways, use employees. Just get used to putting semicolons for now. And then now, if we want to see the tables that are in this database, we can type show tables. Notice that, you know, it doesn't care. It doesn't care whether it's uppercase or lowercase, okay? So these are all the tables that we have. Now, what if we want to find out what columns are contained in a table? We can use the describe command. So we can say describe salaries. So this has the following columns. So these are, uh, this looks weird because it's horizontal, but these are the columns actually here. So we have an employee number. That's probably like our employee ID. We have a salary and we have a from and to this. So we were close. We had some similar information there. And then um, these are the types. <clears throat> so just like C++ and other programming languages, um, well, the ones that are static per se, they uh, they require the type at creation time of the table. So it's not like Python where, where the type can change. So when you're making a table, you have to define what data type is gonna be stored there. This is for efficiency reasons as well, because it has to know with the B-tree magic, like how much space to allocate and things like that. So when you do an integer, you don't just say it's an integer. I mean, actually you could, but you can specify how big of an integer, how many bits you need, how, how big the number has to get so that you can maximize space. Again, this can get really hardcore with space. For things like the faculty mentor webpage, we're not, we don't care that much about space because by the time it scales up to a million students, we have other problems. So we're not too worried about that. But in something like a bank setting, we're like, like a single extra bit for every single user that's using the bank can result in additional terabytes of data, then um, yeah, we wanna, we wanna push this to the limit of maximization, optimization. So that's where the, you can set specific sizes. The date field is just a date field, like it allows you to, to keep uh, a, a month, a day, and a year. There's also like a date time that allows you to keep Linux time as well, so like uh, hour, minute, and second. Uh, if you wanna know what the different types are, you can go on Google, uh, MySQL's uh, documentation. So MySQL data types. So I literally Googled MySQL data types and I found the official documentation. The little dolphin is the logo of MySQL. I like it by the way. And then um, it's, it's massive manual. Like if this was a book, it would probably be like this big. So there's all the chapters here and uh, chapter 11 is just data types. So yeah, numeric data types, for example. They used to have these really cool charts. I don't know where that chart is for the data types. I seem to recall that being a data type, but yeah, there's integers, small int is for small integers as the name implies, decimals are like your, kind of like your floats in a way. Um, but there's also uh, actual floats and reals and double floats, I guess, like doubles. Um, yeah, that's true, because decimals are actually, no, that's a lie. Decimals are, are accurate like integers. They just have 
decimals afterwards. So it's like an integer, but you decide where the dot goes. So it's not a true flow because the flow uses that actually for a floating point system. So yeah. Um, let's look at the string one. So uh, where's the string? The string data type. So we have what's known as the var car. That's the one that's just going to be your average string. And then you typically define how big it can get after it. So like, oh yeah, that's a cool thing. They have a lot of examples. So really like the documentation is top tier, uh, especially because it's Googleable. So you just Google and you get the documentation. But let's just look at, um, yeah, so like bar car four. So that's going to allow you to put four characters. This might be a little tiny, but that's just bar car four. Okay. So yeah, documentation is great. All right. So going back to this. Uh, that's what this type means and then we have this null thing So one of the things that you want to have for good integrity of data is whether when you're creating a new entry in a table a new row You might force someone to have a certain piece of information there. So for example, let's think back to our tables so in our tables we have the pay table right and in the pay table we had in ours we had employee salary and social security number so let's just say that we require to have on file an, empl an employee's social security number. If they're trying to create an entry in the pay table um, section and they leave the social security number empty, then we don't accept the data. You know, it's like when you're trying to fill out a form online and it's like you hit submit and then it reloads the form and it puts little red text like this field is required. Please enter this field, that kind of thing. That's kind of what we want to have happen when we're trying to enter data. That's another beautiful thing about databases that it allows you to, to sort of set that up at, you know, at the basis, at the most basic level to not allow it to have half done data. That is going to cause issues down the line. That's what the null allows you to do. The null basically says that if the null is set to, um, to no, it means that it is required to have that field there. If it's set to yes, then you can leave that field blank when you're inserting it. Okay. Uh, next we have the keys. So there are two types of keys. We have primary keys and foreign keys. Primary keys are the ones that I was talking about earlier where like each table should have a primary key because that's what makes it indexable. Uh, and that's going to be something that is like unique. So there cannot be two rows with the same with the same column that has the same data. If that column is your primary key column and two rows have the same data in it, then it causes an error because it's like you can only, it has to be unique. In this case, for some reason, they chose to do, uh, oh, I, I get why. Yeah, I get why. So, but here, I'll ask you if anybody can think about it as to the case, that would be an issue. So, you know, I would have thought that, uh, like, just having the employee as the primary key would be enough because you don't have two employees with the same employee ID. But, but here, they, they, they went pretty smart. They made it a combination of the employee ID and the starting date, the from table. Why do you think, like, when would be a scenario where my system, where it's just employee ID, would break? We would have a collision. Anyone? I thought of one scenario. Yeah. So I was actually thinking of a variation of that, but that's actually a good scenario too. If you want to reuse employee IDs, then yes, that would be one case. But I was just thinking where you fire the person, then you rehire them. So you have to, you probably gave them the same employee ID. So then you would have two entries with the same actual person. But yes, what you're saying is another good case where you just reassign the employee ID to somebody else because you only, you know, you only have employee IDs up to a thousand and you recycle them. So both cases are true. So yes, very good scenario where um, it would be basically impossible to, in that case, to have a duplicate now that you have the date and the ID. So. Like I said, this stuff requires a lot of development time. See, uh, that would have been a bug and we would have not discovered it until in deployment, some dude gets fired and then the, gets either rehired or somebody else gets the same employee ID and then they have problems and then they contact the, the, the development team and it's been like five years and nobody knows and remembers what was done in the system and it takes like, you know, time to figure what happened and it's a pain. So yeah, developing this stuff requires a lot of planning because of this sort of weird edge case. Okay, with the faculty mentor, I'm pretty sure there'll be some weird edge cases, but it won't be that bad, but it's definitely something to keep in track of. And it won't be as bad there because we could probably just update the database, but 
One of the big things, the big no-nos of, of database development is that when you finally release your database, you rarely want to update it. And what that means is you really want to make new tables. You really want to modify existing tables, especially like that's a big no-no, like add a column, remove a column. Like, no, 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 bad, bad thing to do. Okay. Uh, the default, what is the default? Uh, what is the default? I can't remember what the default is. I think, oh, I think it's, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what the default setting is when you're creating a table is uh, if you allow, if you don't insert data there, then it'll leave it blank. By default, it'll set it to null. That's actually the default's default. But you can also, um, like, uh, put in the, a starting value. So, for example, let's just say that uh, we had the other table that was the... Uh, the um which table will be good for that the employee position table so in this table you know suppose that you you, you allow the current task to be empty when you put them in because you want to put in an entry that has a role and has how many years they have an the employee id but they might not have a current task right there and then so by default it could stay empty but maybe because it's cooler instead of leaving it just blank you might say that the default, whenever you create an entry and you don't actually specify something for that current task column, it auto fills it with the words, no task assigned. So you could set that that way. So whenever you create an entry and you, you, you give it the employee ID, you give it the years with the company and you give it the role, but you don't give it anything for current task, then by default, it's gonna fill it with no task given, okay? So that's what the default field is for. I'm glad I remember that now, okay? The extra though, I don't remember what that's for. So um, yeah, maybe we'll run into it at some point. Okay, so that is what describes us. It allows you to see the structure of an existing database. Uh, and you can, let's just go through really fast now through the other ones. So let's just describe uh, departments. Ah, perfect. Now we finally run into the thing with the semicolons. So in this case, it actually, uh, I didn't put a semicolon at the end of the statement. And uh, instead of, you know, assuming that it's what I wanted, it's actually thinking that I'm still running my query. So I could write more things here and continue that way. If you just press enter, you're gonna make more. So if you wanna get out of this, just press on my columns. That's what I wanted to show you earlier, that uh, when you're writing your queries, you can enter them partially and just keep entering them and it will keep allowing you until you put the semicolon, okay? So uh, if you ever get stuck that way, don't panic, just spam semicolons. Okay. The departments one apparently is a list of departments with a department number and the department name. The department number is only four characters long, up to four characters long. The uh, the bar car is up to 40 characters long, so it's a string. Um, I don't know what that is, but this means it's a primary key. Oh, it's unique. That means this has to be a unique thing. So it's not a primary key, but it still wants it to be a unique name there. So it's kind of like its own sort of local primary key. Uh, so that's that table. Let's look at maybe uh, the employees table. Okay. So show employees. Oops. Oh, sorry. Describe. Describe employees. That one has employee number, birthday. We well, yeah, have birthday. Good point. First name, last name. Gender, okay, that's kind of outdated, but okay. And then hire date. Um, wow, this is actually pretty offensive. Now that I think, you know, with modern time, because like, I guess this is a good example, and yeah, it's kind of messed up because under the uh, type for the, for it, it, for, it's forcing them to either put male or, or female, which is what I guess M and F stand for. Uh, but I guess this is an example of how to of how to limit what you can enter. So here, you can only enter one of the two. So, uh, yeah, these guys should get like, this is, this could be like, we should like sue them. You know, we could make free money from them. Sue them for, for no inclusivity uh, on the database. But hey, maybe we can show you how to update that. Let's, that'll be one thing I'll show you how to update that to make it uh, so it's just a bar card. Okay. But um, yes, so please don't, 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 don't tell the university that I'm showing you this and trying to make a statement or something. I didn't know that was it, but okay. Um, so yeah, there's all that. And then, um, let's see, describe or show tables. Let's look at maybe, uh, 
Titles. That's probably a small table, so we can actually explore that one. Employee number, title, whatnot. Okay, cool. All right, so let's do a select query. So let's just see how big this is. Let's select all from titles. Okay, so what I'm saying is give me all of the entries in this table. It's still massive. <laughs> it's got 400, 443,000 entries. Okay, let's not do that one. Um, Let's try maybe south. Oh, oh, that's, well, actually, now I'm kind of departments. That that shouldn't be too big. So select all from departments. Oh, well, by the way, what's the good practice? The good practice, I suppose, is to uppercase all of your like reserve keywords and then lowercase everything else. So I guess the clean way of doing this would be like this. In fact, the even cleaner way would be to do it like this: select on one line, from on another line. And if you had a work clause, it would be in the third line. So that would be the clean way. In fact, Workbench, the program I was talking about earlier, has something called Beautify in it, which will beautify a query. So it'll take a nasty query like what I would type and make it more look pretty um, with tabulation and everything. So anyways, okay, this is a manageable table. It's got like two, four, six, eight, nine entries. So let's play around with this table for now because that way I don't have to show you the limit by, an order by thing yet. So let's just do what we did earlier. So like, for example, let's go ahead and select only the department numbers. So select department number from departments and draw that. So that just gives us a table with department numbers. Let's say we want to do select department numbers and also department name. We could do it this way or we could just do select all. If there was three columns, then we would just get the ones that we want. We can also make it do it backwards if we just flip this around. See, so I just basically flip the uh, the ordering of the columns. That can be useful, you know, depending on your processing, it might be nice. Um, let's just stick to the department numbers for now, and let's just do a, a where clause. Let's say. Select department numbers where department name is equal to finance. So let's say we want to find out what department number finance is. Let's spell it right and then let's spell it wrong afterwards so you can see that empty table thing. Okay, so here we got finance. <coughs> now let's spell it wrong. We just get an empty set. Now here it's not drawing an empty table, but it's still a set. That's the keyword. So it's still a little list per se. Okay, that's what uh, Eli was asking earlier. Uh, let's get a little fancy and something that might be useful to learn. So this is where we're starting to start learning things. And for this, there's a really good resource. Uh, I was actually, I'm gonna use this as a, as a basis of, so I don't forget things to show you, is uh, W3Schools. So W3Schools has, so documentation is great, but it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes. So if you just want a simple refresher on something, W3 Schools has literally everything you could care about. Uh, all the commands, select, where, and all the other fancy stuff with examples. So like select, you know, here's an example. Select column names from table, that's kind of what we did. Oh, and they have a demo database too. Uh, I'll have to download that and try it out. But, uh, oh yeah, you can run actually queries in, oh yeah, that's right, so you can, you can uh, you can try this yourself and actually run queries on the little table, like, like a test table which is very cool. So I encourage you to play around with this if you don't want to download MySQL. Yes, this is probably nice too. Uh, but I, yeah, I haven't been following this along because I don't want to just, you know, you can go to the website on your own. I'd rather give you different examples. But um, let's look right now at the wildcard section, okay? So this comes in useful when we're trying to search things that are similar it, well, they were know first of all what a wildcard is like a wildcard is basically that uh, We're looking for a string, but instead of looking for an exact string match We can put an asterisk or some sort of wildcard percent sign Whatever it is on the language that we're working with and what it means is that we're looking for everything else to match except that wildcard so like if we're looking for for um, people's whose name starts with the S we might put an S and then afterwards we might put a special wildcard that represents one or more characters. 
So we will find all names that start with S and then have anything afterwards. In the case of MySQL, there are two wildcards that you can use, the percent and the underscore. The underscore is a single character. So that's if we like, you know, let's say that we're looking for, um, 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 car like we want we want something that has the word car but there might also be um, uh, I know that's not a good one because car I was thinking car versus cars but um, let's say that we were looking for someone's name but we don't remember a character okay like like Spencer uh, Spencer's last name, okay? So, like, let's say I don't remember if it's Lucci with a U or, like, with an E, like, Lechi or something, okay? Just something like that, okay? And so we could put the wild card in the in the place of the vowel, that the U, since we don't know if it's a U or E, and then run it through the query. And then that would be one way to, uh, you know, to fix our memory problems, essentially, with the database. Uh, alternatively, with the, with, the, with the zero or more characters, that's more flexible, but can, you know, can give us unwanted results, uh, because there might be somebody's name who's like, who's like, Latiz or something, and, and it might fit under this, the, the the other characters or whatever. So, anyways, let us go ahead and try wild car characters. And for that one, we might want to use the bigger table. So, um, but let's test it first with this table. So let's say we say select apartment. Uh, let's just say select all for now. And so here. Instead of using the equal sign, we are going to use the word like, and then our wildcard. So let's just start out by by using the finance, but we don't we don't remember how to spell finance. We don't know if it's finance like that or like this, you know, whatever. So if we do that, then that put that wildcard, then we are going to essentially get finance there. See, so that's cool. Uh, let's just say that uh, we have two things starting with a letter here. Ah, okay, let's do a fancy one. So let's just say that we want things that have an S in the name of the department. So we are gonna put a wild card up front and wild card behind it. So what that means is that there can be zero or more characters before the S and zero or more characters after the S, okay? So if the department name could be just S, but it could also be human resources because resources has the S somewhere, okay? And they can have more S's, just needs to have one S at least. So if we run this, we get these departments. So as you can see, they all have a lowercase s. Let's see if, if it's, like I was talking about the case sensitive, let's double check on that. So it's not caring about case sensitive with this stuff. So I was wrong on that, because I, I told you it did. My apologies on that. Uh, but yeah, so as you can see, it's matching with the s. So this can be useful for the faculty mentor uh, when you're doing a search system for it. So if you want somebody to be able to search for a student and they can use wall cards, they can, just be aware of SQL injection. With this stuff that's how you that's how you get hacked but um yeah so that's that's uh the usage of wildcards any questions on wildcards like do you want me to try something out i can i guess if you do uh if you do this what are you gonna get so what am i gonna get with this query it's not yeah everything because like it's just saying zero more characters, yeah, you just get everything. So uh, yeah, just kind of conceptual thing. But uh, let's let's play around with the big massive table now, so, and then just use wildcards for that. So that was the um, uh, the employees table, right? So describe employees. So we got. So let's go ahead and select first name from employees where uh, first name is equal. Let's see if something is called Spencer. Okay. Here, yeah, let's let's like let's look at all of their information. Uh, okay, so this is an error where we would have gotten an exception because I mistyped this table name. Empty set, so no one's called Spencer. Let's look for Jorge. Nothing. Let's try wild cards. Let's try, let's try just that. See how many people start with a mess. 
All right, so we got a bunch of people. Um, we just don't have any hardheads. Okay. Let's try Ben. With a wall card, because it might be Benjamin or something. Nothing. Interesting. Well, let's see. The name. So we know for sure there's a thing called Stafford. So let's just look for staff. Huh. They have a lot of Staffords in there, I suppose. Interesting. They must have used just like a random uh, name generator for this stuff. Oh, wait, am I looking? Yeah. Okay. What about Joe? Joanna with an uppercase. Interesting. Let's see. Sure. So, anyways, I think that you get enough. Did you get an idea, right? So let's move on. Um. Okay. So we got wild cards, select statements. Let's uh, let's do something more complicated with a select statement using the and or a not. Okay. So let's say that we are looking for first names that are starting with J O R. But we also would like to limit the last names, okay? So let's just say that the last name has to be like C something. Starts with the C, okay? So we want someone whose first name starts with J-O-R and last name starts with a C. You use the AND clause and you run it. And so now we get all these. So they all start with a C. We could even go further than that and do CA, and then we got basically four, okay? So that's how you use AND. You could also use OR. OR is gonna be just like your C++, where it's gonna be one or the other. So this is gonna give us a bigger list. And in this list, we basically have a lot of people because we have all the ones that have that last name. So maybe let's make it a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, Well, we know there's none with that, so let's just do it like that. So then all of them are gonna be CA, right? Okay. Um, there's also not. That's gonna give us a ton of resources of things like that. Uh, well, and has to be here, and not. Um, if we do or, then we're literally going to get like most of the most of the whole list, right? Because like everything that's not CAS is going to appear. But if we do and, then we're limiting it. So for example, we know that there's staff, right? So that's giving us all of the staff words that do not start with CAS. If we want to see the ones that start with CAS, we would do it like that. So we look for the staff or cast person person. He would not show up here, okay? Uh, other thing that could be useful is how to sort the resulting information. So we got a bunch of information here. What if we want to sort it? We have the order by command. So you can use order by and then you can list the column you want to sort by. So let's say we want to sort by last name. You do that and bam, you got it sorted in a descending order. So as you can see the last name, this ones are sorted by descending order, as you can see from the resulting query. And it's only sorting the results. It's not sorting the entire database. Uh, if you want to sort in ascending order, you type in ASC. And, oh, I guess it was already in this. I said descending. I meant ascending. But let's say we sort in descending then. Oh. <sighs> right, hold on. I screwed up my copy pasting, I think. Order by descending. There we go. Okay, so now it's reverse from Z to N. So I guess the default is ascending, okay? So you never need to put ascending like that. Uh, you can, I believe you can order by two things as well. So for example, within this, if you want to order like, uh, like let's say you want to order also by... Uh, What's that employee ID thing called? It's just employee ID. Emp ID, I think. Emp no. Okay. Emp no. So I, I believe you can do this. I haven't tried this in a while. But if you put a comma and then you put emp no, I think it'll sort by both, maybe. Let's see. So within the people that would be equal, but we need to have somebody with the same name twice. 
for this to actually be relevant. Yeah, so like this guy. So as you can see, within this name of the same first and last name, it's sort of the employee number in a descending manner, okay? Now, if you want to die by ascending and the other one by descending, I, <laughs> that gets tricky. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm, you, you probably have to like do a sub query or something to, to be able to, to, uh, to do that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, because I can't think of like off the top of my bat how you could flip them. So uh, you'd have to probably query the information first, sort that information how you want it, and then query it again, sort by the other column. Like since you, since some of you were in that two, two class, you remember with the with the with the with the biogram assign, assignment, the first part, you basically sort it twice, sorted by the first column and then the second column. That's how we fix that issue that we were trying to sort by, by two columns. It's kind of the same thing here you would do if you remember that. That's what we would have to do. Not fun, not fun. Okay, so that's your order by. Um, see what else you want. Um, let's look at uh, limit. Oh, I think I'll try to remember. I think I remember limit. Let's try it. So, as you can see, we're getting a huge amount of information, right? Uh, you can limit how much information you get by saying limit and then a number. And then, yeah, yeah I remember that one. That, that allows you to uh, limit how many uh, rows you get back. Normally, you don't want to do that because you actually want to get all the information back. However, when you're when you're previewing data, like when you're looking at these massive tables and you're just experimenting, you want to use limit to limit, you know, so you don't get like an overflow of like just data. Okay, um, so like you know, this number is how many rows you get back, and you're just getting the top ones. There's a way that you can get like the the, the like for example, if you want to limit seven, but you want to get the the from seven to fourteen. There's a way that I don't remember. I have to look here. So let me look for limit. So here's limit. Um, not really helping. Okay, that doesn't add that in depth of that. Um, let's look at the official one. That's not good. I clicked. There we go. Is this the limit? Oh, this is select. Limit. Offset. So you need an offset comma row count. Oh, okay. So let's get the first 10 just so we have a base base point. Is clear work? I can't remember if clear works. No, clear doesn't work. There's a way to clean the screen. Maybe it's clean. CLS. I don't remember. Okay, whatever. Let's just do enters. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the 10. So now if we were to say limit 3, we would get the first 3, right? So you can see that these 3 match these 3. Let's just say we want to get the next 3. So I think, and this is kind of what I was thinking too, but you do it like this. But So as you, so the next 3 should be these. So yeah, that worked. So the offset. So, that's, so the first number is going to be your offset. And the next number is how many after the offset you want. So like if we did 10 here, we would get spots 10 to 13. Okay, make sense? Again, this is mostly useful when you're just looking at data on a terminal versus like actually doing a query because you want to get all the data back in a query usually. Like you don't want just part of it. Uh, but I guess actually, you, you know, yeah, this is the one case where I've used limit in the real world application uh, where it helped me. In my PhD dissertation, I had a massive database with just a bunch of text. And I didn't want to uh, to slow down my computer by just querying for like insane amounts of data and then having that being sent back at once. So I sent it out back in chunks. And I think I, I limited and I sent back like 10,000 rows at a time. Uh, and that was just to to uh, to not run out of memory and things like that. So yeah, I just had to remember what the offset was whenever I would run it. and. Uh, I remember that being still not very good or efficient. So, because you're rerunning the query every time that you are running this. Like, you know, if you're already run the query and this time I do 20, you're still running the entire query, which is slow. So it's not the best of things to do anyways. So yeah. Okay. Questions?
Maybe we'll do half an hour most, and then we'll stop. We can always do some more another day. Is there a specific thing about SQL that you want me to talk about? Is there any command that you run into that you would like clarification on? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and do some joins. That's going to be the next thing you probably need to know. And then we'll, we'll end it with how to create a table. Okay? Because that one I can just show you some code and you just kind of remember it and refer back to it when you're in search. Okay? So, uh, let's go ahead and think of a query that we would need to table for. So, right now we have on their employees, we have this information and under salaries, we have this information. So, suppose that I asked you, by the way, what are the comments and that's a good, that's a good point. What is the, the command to do comments in SQL? I think it's two slashes, but it might be the pound. It's been a while. I, I, I just, I have, I've used it so many times, but I can't, let me see on the references here. Oh yeah, so you have two dashes for, for a single line comment. So like, this is a comment, like that. I think that works, okay. And then you can also do, there's another way. Ah, okay, it's the, it's the old C way. So you use the backslash, forward slash, asterisk, like that and then that's a multi-line comment okay multi-line comment okay so yes that is on the w3 school but yeah you know while since you write comments okay so um let us go ahead and say that we have that, that your boss comes and asks you you're dealing with this database and they ask you and they say hey can you please give me a list of all of the employees and how much money they make? And by employees, like, I don't care about their ID. I just want to have their first name and their last name and then the uh, salary. Okay, just give me a list of that. And you're like, yes, boss, right there. You know, give me a second. Okay, so we look at our database and we don't have a single table that contains all of the information we want. There's no table that, I mean, there's a salaries table, but that doesn't contain the name. And then there's an employee table that contains the name, but no salary. So we need information from two tables. This is a very common thing that you end up doing in SQL. So you divide the tables to speed things up and make it more efficient, but there comes a time when you do need to put things together. Now, yes, you could make another table with the information that you need exactly, but uh, other than this query, you're never gonna really need it, so it's not worth having. It's re do repetitive information unnecessary. It would be strictly, I mean, yes, it would be nice to have it ready to go because it would speed it up, but at what cost of having just redundant information that is repeated that you have to handle you have to make sure that you have to manage when things get deleted it's not fun so this is kind of a one-off so you use what is known as a join okay so how do i do that okay well first of all you're going to do your select statement in fact let's go ahead and type the command here first and then copy paste it okay can you see this or is this too small? Should I make it bigger? Can you, can you, it's good? Okay. All right. So let us go ahead and select what we want. So that's first name and last name. So that is going to be first name, last name. So first name. Oh, by the way, you don't want to have spaces in your variable names. So that's why you see the underscores. So first name, last name, and salary which I think is just salary, but let me check. Salary, yeah, okay. So that's the information you want. Now, where do you want it from? Well, you need it from two tables. You need it from the employees table and from the salaries table. So employees, it doesn't matter which order you put these on, salaries. Okay, now if you're trying to do really nice syntax, might as well teach you good manners, then you put that on its own row. Salaries. Okay, and then you put your work clause. Um, actually, you don't have any work clause because you're not trying to uh, 
Well, you think you will, but not for the reasons that you would specify because you want all of the employees. But now you need to link the tables together because if you just do it like this, I don't even think this is going to work, but let's see what happens when you do this. You're going to get bad information, that's for sure. It just did nothing. Uh, semicolon. I don't know. It's just kind of ch like thinking for a while. In fact, you know what? Let's add one thing already at, at first. Let's just put a limit. 10. You know what it's probably doing? It's probably just joining it together in a really bad way. Okay. The whole thing died. Uh, use employees. doesn't like the okay I don't know why it doesn't like the line feeds from here I guess we'll have to get rid of them before we copy paste but yeah so if I do that notice that we're getting this is this right is this wrong you might think oh well we got the information we want it's not really right now to, to show you that I have to show you the big table which is the one that's really getting hung up. But um, what is happening now is, here, I can prove it to you by, by searching for a specific employee's uh, salary. So um, here, let's do uh, um, select, all from salaries where salary is equal to six zero nine two nine okay I don't know we do have a couple of employees that do have that salary but okay let's see how many employees we have so that's 63 rows okay so to prove to you that this is wrong let's see how many employees are showing up with this salary in that row so let's just show 70, because if we show 70, then that means there's way more than there should be, okay? In fact, go with 80. There's 80, okay? So as you can see, this is wrong, because in the salaries table, there are only 63 employees that earn this exact amount. But this table is so massive, like really, really massive, that 80 employees, at least 80 of them have the same. And I would bet you that the size of the table, so that if the salaries table has 10,000 entries, then there's gonna be 10,000 entries with that amount of salary. What is happening right now as we have the query is it's doing a union. And with a union, it's, it's like a, it's like combinatronics in a way. It's combining all possible combinations of the three columns, okay? So like, if there's 20 salaries, then it's gonna have all 20 salaries for all 20 employees for all possible combos. So like, first name, John. Let's say there's two, there's, let's just say there's two, uh, there's two entries, John Doe and Jane Doe. And there's two salaries, 20,000 and 40,000, okay? John Doe is making 20,000. And so he would show up as well, John, look at bad example. John Doe and Jane Smith, okay? So you would end up seeing the following combinations there. You would end up seeing, so we have two entries. We have John Doe making 20,000 and Jane Smith making 40,000. So the way we have this now, it's just making a combination saying, you're gonna show John Doe there, you're gonna show John Smith, you're gonna show Jane Doe, Jane Smith, and this is gonna show up twice. The first time it's gonna have 20K for all of these. And the second time it's gonna show 40K for all of them. 
Because mathematically, that's just what you're doing. You're just doing a union. So it's just doing all possible combinations. That's why it's hanging there. Because it's, it's like making a massive table, trying to combine everything. Okay? As you can see, with this amount of entries, how many combinations it made. You can use combinatronics to figure out the amount of rows that you would have gotten back with such a massive table. It would have been like insanely big. Okay? So that's not what we want. That's bad. That's just a union not... I mean, there are some cases where unions we want. This is not one of them. Okay? So we need to link both tables so that we only get the scenarios where the employee IDs match. So we are going to use the WHERE clause for that. We're going to say WHERE employee number is equal to employee number. Now that's going to confuse the computer because it's going to be like, ah, what? There's two employee numbers. There's an employee number in the employees table and there's an employee number in the salaries table. So think back to object oriented programming in C++ and how you use the member access operator, right? The dot. And that's what you need to do here. So you're going to say where employees dot employee number is equal to salaries dot employee number. And in fact, you don't put it here because it's like, it's kind of like the disk pointer, like you don't always have to put it, but you could technically go ahead and say something like salaries dot salary here. And here you could say employee, uh, employees table dot last name. You don't, however, you don't have to because it's not ambiguous. Where it would be ambiguous, and I'll show you, is if we wanted to print out the employee number, because then they would actually complain and be like, which employee number are you talking about? The one from the employee number table or the one from the salaries table? So anyways, this is going to be your good query now. Hopefully the pasting doesn't break. Uh, unknown table. Oh, yeah, I, uh, I have too many Ps in the employees. There we go. Unknown column salaries in field list. Oh, I put a comma instead of a period. There's that. So just like C++, you know, you, comp you, keep, you keep compiling until it actually compiles kind of thing. You just keep fixing errors. There we go. So um, it, it, it's hard to see if it worked or not because I used the limit. Let's try to take out the limit and, and see how just massive this is. Let it, let it run for a little bit. Um, it shouldn't be as massive as the other one. Um, Oh no, something's definitely wrong. We have a lot of repeats on the names. Okay, let's just stop there at this point. Um, yeah, something seems wrong there with the salaries. Let me check. Employees that employee number is equal to salaries that employee number. Unless the sal unless the employees are actually earning different amounts of money. Um, let's check that. So select uh, all from salaries where salary is equal to, let's just say, um, oh wait, no, we have to join them before we can do that. Here, let's find out the employee number for, for this guy, uh, this person here. So select all from employees where try, where, I guess that's first name, right? Because we put that, yeah, first name is equal to try GDE. Oh, I forgot. There's like a million different names here. Okay. And then the last name is equal to Merlo. Okay. And last name is equal to Merlo. Okay, so we have his employee number now. So now, now that we have that, let's look in the salaries table. So select all from salaries where employee number is equal to 469524. Okay, so this guy, so, so, so this database actually does have multiple salaries per employee uh, with different timelines, as you can see here. So I guess they got races and stuff. So, okay, so, 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 so our table, our query is correct. Um, the one that we did earlier. So this query is correct. I, I, I just kind of was suspicious because I saw the multiple salaries per name and I thought something was wrong, but that is correct. 
all of the salaries here are going to match. So that's coming rows two, four, six, eight, ten, about eleven. And this has eleven. So yeah, so yeah, our query is correct. Okay. Sorry that it's such a massive table uh, data. I didn't think it would be that big, but because sometimes when you get things really big, it can become annoying. But yeah, this is correct. Okay. Now let me show you a case where this complains about ambiguity. So let's say we wanted to print out the employee number next to the first name. Column emp no in field list is ambiguous. So that's where it's complaining because when you do have so when you when you have different when your call when your uh, column names are unique per per table uh, and even if not at least they're unique in that query. So like in this case I got two tables I'm working with and the ones I'm printing are unique. There's no problem. You don't need to specify. So like this is redundant right here. I was just putting it for for example. It's redundant. You can leave it there. In fact, it might be good practice, but you don't have to. Uh, however, this one is not redundant because it technically, there's two of them. Even though they're they're the same, they're literally going to be the same uh, because you because of your work clause, you still got to specify which one you want. So just put one of them and then it'll be happy. Okay, so there we go. Um, just to show you that what happens, let's just do the same query, but this time let's go ahead and just say select all. I want to show you all the columns that appear. Okay, so when we do the select all, you can see the join uh, happening, and you can see both both tables basically next to each other, and the alignment that's happening between the left and the right tables is being done on the employee number, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. Now, here you see the data kind of repeated twice because this one's the employee number from the salary table, and this one's the employee number from the employee table. Everything else, I believe, is pretty much unique. Okay. So very important, like what I just did, the whole connection of two tables that you will definitely end up doing for the faculty mentor database. And in general, when you're working with databases, that's, that's kind of like the where like SQL stops being easy and starts to get tricky as you do these joins. So how do we feel about like a join? Is there any that you want me to try? I mean, you kind of have to know the data, but you know, let's let's link it with another table. How about that? Let's just keep making it bigger. Um, we'll do one more. So let's say uh, again. Let me show the tables. Uh, so what So this has first name, hire date, salary. It's nothing really cool. Um, what is what is in department? What is in titles? Is there an employee number there? Yeah, okay. So let's just say what the title of the employee is. Let's say we want to add the title. So we want the employee number, first name, last name, salary, and title. Right? So the title is going to be from the titles table. Okay? Title like that. We don't really need that because it's going to be unique. So we'll leave it like that. But we do need to add it here to the table list and then we do need to do the join so employee number is equal, uh, dot sorry employees dot employee number is equal to titles dot employee number and by the way sometimes some of the tables I mean you shouldn't run into the situation because you're building your own database but sometimes in some tables, like the keys will not have the same name. So like, for example, just because people, I mean, this is when you should do good design, but bad design is not good. But like maybe, maybe in this table, it was called employee number. That employee number table column is actually called employee number. So it doesn't match. That's okay. It still works as long as you are aware that it's the same one. It should, it will, there's no reason why you wouldn't want to use the same name, but you know, there's a lot of weird things in the world out there. So. Yeah. Ah. Uh, limit by 10, employee. Okay, so that's actually good. Let's try that again. Place clipboard. Just give it a second. This, this, this is the big, big data we're working with, I guess. Um, but yeah, that should pretty much take care of that. Once it, oh, I know what it is. I have a semicolon here. So that's just making a massive table again, that union. 
employees employee in work class Oh, well, I turned out of complete fail there. That's what I meant to do. I remember when I was showing that. Okay, there we go. So now we have the same information. Again, it, we got a bunch of different entries because, because you know, this, this, oh, you know, this might be a, like, I, I know we want to get all the information, but let's just say we wanted to show like one of the uh, entries per employee. We could use a distinct keyword for that. So we'll try that. But anyways, you can see here that we joined another table so now we can see the title along with the salary so this information is coming from three tables now okay suppose that we wanted um well first let's do the distinct thing um as a separate yeah i'm trying to think what's more efficient over time before we do that let's do something that's actually more useful okay so what I've shown you is how to do queries and put multiple tables together and whatnot. But like, okay, this, as you can see, this is where the cool mathematics of this come out. So like, whenever you do a query, you always get back a table, right? And that's by design. That's how the math like works. So the cool thing about this is that the table that you get back from your query, you can do a query on that table as well. So you can apply the same stuff that we've been doing to the resulting new table. It's like a temporary table, but you can do it. So how do you do that? Well, uh, that's called a nested query. And you use parentheses. Uh, let me see if I can pull up an example. Just so I, I think you use parentheses and you're good to go, but uh, I would like to see one. Mm. Okay, I think we're just going to your I think we just put it in parentheses but anyways let's say that we would like to select um, what would be a good query that I can do here let's just say we want to select from this I'm trying to think of a query that actually would be real world scenario useful in this data so we have employee numbers first names um, Oh yeah, yeah, let's just select the highest pay of each of the employees and show that one. So we show the highest latest pay, okay? I think that would be useful. That's hard, but we'll see if we can do it. So we're going to select just the, the first name and the pay. How about that? So first name and uh, we'll call it yeah, with the first name. And then salary from, and so I think we have to use the ask command here. Ask command is to make a pointer. Or maybe we, I think this, maybe this will work. I think you just put this all in parentheses. Let's just limit it to 10 for now. I think you just do it like that. Hmm, something feels like I'm missing from this check. Let's query SQL. It's called a sub query. Uh, no. Okay, so, so this is one way to do it. Okay. <coughs> so, let's just say select first name, salary from, um, Trying to think how we can do this. Let's just do something simple. So select salary from salaries where salary in, and then we put the query like that. No, that's not going to get us what we want.
what this would get us is like, for example, if what this query gets us is like a list of, the, of numbers that we want to use for another query, we could use this. Uh, but it's not really relevant as it is now. I'm trying to think how we would do that. Let's maybe, I know you can use the ask command. So the way you use the ask command is like, you can, uh... you can use ask and then give it a name, but I'm trying to see if there's another more proper way to do this. I have to think about that. I can't think of an easy solution to do that. Um, at least with the nested query. But if just to solve this issue, so forget about the nested query for now. If we just wanted to get the highest salary of each person here, then um, I think we could put distinct around here. No, 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 that would only give us a thing. Uh, I don't know, that's tricky. I might have put myself in a spot where I'm not sure what to do now. How would I get the highest amount per person? So I have to run through this and find the highest one. But for each one, we can definitely order by by salary, and that, at least that will give us the first one on each entry, and then we can parse that in Python or something or, or program and and. Uh, at least have that issue. Uh, oh, forgot to take this away. Ooh, that's that's uh, that's trying to sort the entire result before it returns it to us. So that's taking a while to run. So we don't want to do that. Hmm. Maybe I can order by the limited stuff out. See if that lets me do it. No, so it wouldn't let me do that. So the order by is going to sort by salaries, but that's going to screw up the order of the uh, of the people because it's just going to go by salary and it's going to change the order of these.
So I can't think of an easy solution for that. Sorry about that, but I can't think of an easy solution for that. I mean, you could parse this data and then just run it through a for loop. And then every time you see a new name, just save the highest salary and then store that. Um, but I can't think of a way to do it on SQL right now. There's probably a way, but it's it's more complicated than I thought. So, yeah, I'll think about it. Maybe I'll find a solution later. I'll share it. But yeah, um, well, it's already one. I haven't shown you how to answer things yet. So uh, I'll do like a five minute version, but then um, I think uh, I think that you can then look at documentation. So just to sh let me pull up the employees table, or sorry, the employee SQL query that insert that created this massive database. Ooh, how big is that though? Okay, that's not too bad. So if we do more employees SQL. So when you create a table, you use the create table command, and then you name the table, and then you list all those data types that I list <coughs> that I told you about. Again, this is white space insensitive, but you still want to make it like this to make it clean to read. You list the variable name, the variable type, and then any extra specifications that you might have, whether it's a primary key, whether it's null or not null, uh, and then um, what were the things we saw? Oh, the, the uh, default, if you want to give it a default, you list all of that right here. You separate them by commas like this and then um, that's pretty much what you do when you end up with a semicolon I didn't get to talk about foreign keys I that is something that maybe we can talk about some other time uh, that is for data integrity linking two tables together and then um, when you want to insert something into the database Where's an insert one? Maybe the load salaries. Let's try that. So more load salaries. Okay. Yeah. So let's just look at salaries one first though. So when you insert something into a database, you use the insert into command. You list the table name. You don't, I don't think you need to put these quotes like that. You can put normal ones or nothing. No quotes at all will work too. I think this is just for safety if you're using spaces in your variable names, which you shouldn't. Then you use values with an S at the end. There's another version to insert without the S, but yeah, you just insert multiple values, just put zero, one or more. You can use values, you put a parentheses, and then you just insert the data separated by comma um, in the same order as you have it in your when you're creating it. There is a way to insert it out of order um, by listing the column names first, but there's no reason to do that. I, I discourage you from doing that. Just do it in the same order. That way you can just do it like this. So like, this is probably gonna be the employee ID. This is going to be the uh, salary amount, the from date and the to date, or what do they call it, the start and end date. And they all match. And then at the end, it just ends with a closing uh, parentheses. So if I look at, uh, the end of that it's, it's a two size file because it's that massive you can see that at the end oh it doesn't even end there um, oh well there, here it is there's a semicolon but I think it's missing a closing parentheses uh, oh I guess not no I guess not so yeah but yeah you just put a, 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 a semicolon and end it for the insert okay so again you start inserting by saying values, and then you put your, your segment. So here's one of them in parentheses, separate by comma. Here's the second one. And then the last one, instead of a comma, you put a semicolon and you're good to go. Okay? So that's how you insert. There's also the drop table command to delete a table. If you try to create a table that already exists, you're going to get an error. And then you have to drop the table first. So you can use drop table if exists. That way, when you're creating a table, if it exists, it'll drop it and then create a new one. So if not, because if you try to drop a table that doesn't exist, you get an error as well. So that's why you wrap it with an if exists statement. I can do another one of these once you 
play around with SQL and you want more advanced things, uh, but I, I don't want to run you guys down. And I think two hours is a good length. Does anyone have any questions about anything? At least now you know the basics of how to query data, which is very important. It's end of semester, yeah. I mean, like, this is the start, man. First, you got to work. I mean, it's going to be like an August. At some point, we have... So, well, first of all, let me let me stop the recording. Uh,